Ronnie, thank you very, very much. I, again, I thank Nancy uh, and Ronnie for the opportunity to join you uh, this week, and it will be the week uh, since uh, we will be with you uh, t through Thursday. So as Ronnie suggested this morning, please, if we don't get a chance to answer questions during the formal sessions, that is part of the role of us being here for the week with you. Uh, so that you can have opportunities to ask any of the faculty members, uh, and I thank the faculty members in advance uh, for being available. I also want to welcome you uh, as the president of the SMA uh, this year uh, to not only the Women's Health Conference, but also our annual scientific assembly that will be held in Charleston, uh, South Carolina. This and it starts Halloween, and then it goes through to November 2nd. So please, uh, if you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to answer them for you. As Ronnie suggested, my passion, has, in addition to academic medicine and then the dark side of administration, uh, has been hypertension uh, and vascular biology. Uh, I'm a mutt. I'm not trained in any fellowship uh, training, et cetera. I'm not board certified in anything but internal medicine. I've done primary care my entire life. But I did plop at Boston University, uh, in where I did my internal medicine residency. And in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, Boston in general, but Boston University specifically was a hotbed uh, for hypertension uh, and uh, was one of the first centers, among others, across the nation to recognize uh, the, the, the consequences of hypertension and had a specific center for hypertension where actually I did my fellowship training. It was a gamble at the time because I said, are you sure I can make a living out of this you know, for, the, for the rest of my life? And I plan on living a long time. And they said, well, we're not sure about that, but we'll teach you something while you're, while you're along the way. As Dr. Pesiak said, I, I'm actually going to do a paradigm shift uh, this week when I talk about hypertension. It'll like, sort of be bookends. And that is to talk about something that's probably radical, that's not in any guidelines, uh, but I actually firmly believe will be in guidelines, uh, not in, if not in the immediate future, in the distant future. So I want to share these uh, concepts and ideas with you. They're radical because when I was trained, the idea of combination therapy, if you even mention the word, uh, even my medical school and in my internal medicine and fellowship training, that was absolutely, you were, you were just ostracized. That's voodoo medicine. You can't use combination therapy. You've got to start with one medicine, maximize the dose, add a second, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that dogma has continued today. And in fact, I, don't even, I can't even believe these words are coming out of my mouth uh, to discuss fixed dose combination therapy for you. But I want to I want to introduce it to you not as a not as a concept. We know they exist, these, and we use these agents clinically. But I actually mean as the primary means of treating hypertension. A lot of this epiphany that I've had over the last three to five years has come from my role with the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control. As Dr. Pesiak said, I was fortunate enough to be asked to to play a leadership role. Uh, in it, when, at its auspices and implementation, and that is the, gro the global control of hypertension. Clearly, global means worldwide. We have started in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's been so successful that it has transformed to global hearts, the Global Hearts Program of the WHO and the CDC, and now it's moving to, chi to India, China, and Mongolia, uh, and then it's going to be back to back to Africa and Sub-Sahara uh, Africa, as you will. So many of the things that I'm talking to you about during this week have actually come out of that program because we had no limits. There was a blank piece of paper. They just said, start somewhere. They locked us in a room in Miami for about three days uh, in 2013. And this is what we came up with as a concept. And now I can actually talk to you about results five years later. It's the fi fifth year anniversary of the program. And what's crazy to me is I'll go to all these other countries, travel around the world, I'll come back to my own institution in Columbia, South Carolina, at USC, and we're not doing any of it. Uh, and our control rates are abysmal. Our adherence rates are abysmal. And we ask ourselves, well, why? Well, let's talk about some of that. The learning objectives are already in your, in your, uh, your, your packets, et cetera. One of the first things that we had to address when we, when we started talking about the treatment of hypertension in low to middle income countries on a global aspect was what are the barriers to treatment that are present, not only in high income countries like the United States and Europe, but also in low income countries 
throughout the Caribbean, Latin America, and obviously Africa. Well, we listed several of these papers. Then everything that I'm going to show you has been published. And I'll tell you when it's hot off the presses and or to be published. But this has been published in the Journal of Clinical Hypertension now as the foundation framework paper uh, of the program. And we talked about barriers to the patient. We talked about health care provider barriers. And then health system, access to care uh, barriers. And you can see them outlined here. There are, and there could be many, many more. These were just the ones we came up with over a couple days. But what I'd like to refer to you to is barriers that I think we here right now today can do something about. And I mean today in Kiowa, South Carolina, because we're all going to go back to our practices. And then the other question that I asked myself was, this day was supposed to be for, for early childhood development and, and adolescence. Well, why are we going to talk about hypertension on the very first day? Maybe we should leave that only until the, you know, the last day of the, and I should just take up the whole day uh, because it would be our, you know, our middle ages and advanced ages. However, I talked to my pediatrician colleagues, and it's a worldwide epidemic, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, regarding childhood hypertension and clearly adolescent hypertension. So it's appropriate. I'd like to center on three that are obviously shown in the, the yellow. Poor adherence to treatment, how can we address that? Therapeutic inertia, I want to largely center on. And then finally, trying to decrease the complexity of our medical, or our medicine re regimens and our medical uh, treatment protocols, if you will. And I think we should address, we can address all three of these over the week, and we're not going to just address them this first, uh, this first session. And then after that, you have to have kind of like key elements. Uh, of your program, and this can be local, this could be your clinic, this could be your hospital system, this could be your region, uh, et cetera, and I urge you to, to really consider following some of these steps because they work. You have to strategy, we'll talk about guidelines and treatment algorithms in passing, that's critical. If you're going to control blood pressure and you're not doing it by an algorithm, you're not going to be able to do it. Registries, you have to know who you're treating, how you're treating, What's their blood pressure levels, their medications, and are they controlled or not controlled? But more importantly, the use of standardized medications that are widely available and that are integrated into your treatment programs. And then you can see other, obviously, very, very uh, critical elements such as patient-centeredness, your healthcare system, the adequacy of it, the, the complexity, uh, the communication within that system, and of course, community involvement and getting all the stakeholders together is critical. When I, when I was asked uh, in those initial meetings with the CDC and the World Health Organization, everybody asks me, asked me, you know, Dr. Petty as an authority, what do you think the major reason patients are not controlled and are not adherent, et cetera? And I said the major reason that we are not controlling hypertension, at least I could speak from the United States and I could speak from firms several regions in my academic career, including, including Texas with Dr. Pisiak for many years, is clinical inertia. Believe it or not, the majority of the lack of control of hypertension is our fault. We've been, we've been blaming the patient, and the patient has a role, absolutely. Patients are non-adherent, et cetera. But most of the, the issue with controlling hypertension is on our end. That's the, good, the, that's the bad news. The good news is we can fix it. So what do I mean by clinical inertia? And it's not only in hypertension. Clinical inertia is ubiquitous uh, throughout, throughout modern medicine. And it's the lack of changing the therapy, adjusting the therapy, initiating the therapy, augmenting the therapy when it's indicated. We just don't do it. And I can't tell you why. I can give you many reasons that I think are the, is the reason but it's clinical inertia. If we could just solve, and even in hypertension, which is relatively simple because it's medication driven largely, obviously with healthcare and lifestyle modification, but if we can address hypertension, then we can move on to other diseases or we can do them in parallel. Well, what is this clinical inertia? And is it, is it real or is it um, getting older? Is it Memorex, if anybody remembers those commercials? You just come and see me in the break and we can commiserate. This is our Veterans Administration. Now, our Veterans Administration has reasonable access. Obviously, we could always do better. 
including in Columbia, South Carolina, at our Veterans Hospital, the Dorn uh, VA. But it's, it's reasonable access. It's free. You can go as often as you want. So many of those barriers that I listed, it's got a health system. It's got an outstanding electronic medical record with registries and outcomes. It could, you ask the VA anything, they can find it for you with a push of a button. But look at this data. Despite sick patient coming, same patient, six times per year in the VA system, 39% had blood pressures greater than 160 over 100, or over 90. And 25%, only 25% were controlled by our standard control rate of less than 140 over 90. In the ones that, that treatment was intensified during those six visits, systolic blood pressure fell. No surprise, in those six visits when blood pressure was not intensified or initiated, systolic blood pressure rose. So the authors concluded that most clinicians do not aggressively control hypertension from this one center. And again, the VA system removes many of those barriers that I showed on that first slide. So the blame, you know, it's getting more difficult to share. This is even more interesting data. And this is from the early 2000s. Look at, this, look at the data that the percentage of visits where patients came to the physician's office or the, or the, or the healthcare provider's office and medication intensification was indicated. And it's human nature, but this is wild human nature. If the systolic blood pressure was greater than 180, 55% of patients left without a change in their medications, without an intensification. That's bad enough. But as you get lower and lower blood pressures, we are less likely to intensify medications. So if your blood pressure was 150 to 160 systolic, you only had a, what, what's that? 13% chance of having your blood pressure medication intensified. That's clinical inertia. Why? We know that that, that blood pressure needs to be treated. We wouldn't argue that. If I put 140 over 90 or greater, it'd probably be 95 or 98% of individuals would leave the office without a blood pressure medication intensification. Well, you know, that's national data. We in South Carolina, we're better, right? At least that's what I've been told the last 11 years I've been here. Although Randy tells me that in Alabama, we're, even, we're better than South Carolina. I've heard that. I'm tired of it. In any event, this is our data from South Carolina, right here from MUSC, from Charleston. My colleagues have done an outstanding job well before I arrived in the state of South Carolina. And the basic bottom line of this data is those individuals that left with therapeutic inertia at the physician's visit had higher blood pressures and less blood pressure control. Those individuals that had blood pressure therapy intensified had lower systolic and diastolic blood pressures and significantly greater blood pressure control. So it's happening, obviously, even locally. And then there's this data. We're going to talk about the guidelines in a few days and hypertension guidelines, but in general, as you're going to hear again, in general, our treatment targets have been going down. In other words, the target that we want to lower the blood pressure to has been steadily decreasing over the last two to three decades. To accomplish that, we know from clinical trials, it needs three to four antihypertensive medications, depending on where you start. That's a given that most patients are going to need two antihypertensive medications, if not three or four. And that's an important point to keep in mind when you see the patient on day one. The likelihood of that patient being treated with one antihypertensive medication and achieving blood pressure goal, and thus target control, is extraordinarily unlikely. So why aren't we taking that into account? We know it. So, Maybe it's time to consider a paradigm shift, and that is to consider the use of combination antihypertensive therapy earlier. This could be accomplished by single pill, two separate pills, or if we're lucky enough, a fixed dose combination, if it just happens to come into that, in that combination. To me, right now, it doesn't matter. I'd rather it come in a fixed dose combination because it's only one pill instead of two. 
and it solves many other issues. On the other hand, let's not worry about that today. The advantages are numerous. Number one, most are eventually going to need two, three, four medications anyway. Number two, greater efficacy. We know that when you use two complementary classes together, the blood pressure is lowered. It's not only additive, but in many cases, it's synergistic, especially across demographics, like young, old, black, white, Hispanic, big, tall, overweight, lean. More importantly, we know that you can use lower doses of, e of, the, of either single medication in combination than when you use it as a single drug, and that would help side effect profile. And in fact, some of the complementary antihypertensive classes mitigate the side effects of each other. Wow, that's like getting something free. I like free. And then obviously it simplifies the regimen. There's data, although not huge, but there's data that support better adherence on the patient's end. It definitely overcomes and reduces clinical inertia because if you use one drug, think about this. If you use one drug at dose A, then you wait another month or two to dose, to dose B, and then another month or two to dose C, you're on one drug at the maximal dose. Maybe six months later, that's clinical inertia. And you haven't even lowered it to go. Add two of them together. And again, I've already mentioned it. When complementary drugs are chosen, I'm going to show you the data, it eliminates the demographic variable in hypertension. You don't have to talk about anything more than just the blood pressure. And finally, there's economic benefits. It definitely lowers healthcare costs, less patient visits, less copays if it's a fixed dose combination, et cetera. I could go on and on and on, but Dr. PZX's not going to let me. It's not new. This is how we started treating hypertension. I don't know how we lost our way. The seminal study conducted in the United States in, at the, in the VA that showed that, treating, that lowering blood pressure significantly reduces clinical outcomes, cardiovascular disease outcomes, was done with triple fixed dose therapy compared to placebo. This is how we started. Look, look at the triple drugs a diuretic, a sympatholytic, and a vasodilator. In the 60s, this is it. This is, this is what we had. And then, of course, another group got placebo. And what, what was shown? That dramatically cardiovascular outcomes was, were, were dramatically lowered by just lowering the blood pressure. But in, interestingly enough, it used a triple fixed dose. It was called Serapis at the time. Now, I'm not that old, <laughs> but it's OK. Well, some of our guidelines do incorporate using two drugs at the same time, starting with two drugs, and or a fixed dose combination of those two drugs. And this is the JNC7. But our latest a ACCHA guidelines have also reinforced this, that if your blood pressure is greater than 20 over 10 millimeters of mercury to start from goal, we already know you're going to, use two, you're going to need two medications. So you can go ahead, by guidelines, start two antihypertensive medications at once, at that initial visit, either in a fixed dose combination, if it comes in that, or two separate pills. So even in our guidelines, it's in there, but it's, it's buried under mountains of pages, and it's only under these circumstances, when your blood pressure is 160 over 100 or more, or 20 over 10 from your goal. But nevertheless, it's in our guidelines. We're OK. I'm OK. We're, you're OK. So how about mitigation of side effects? When you use a renin-angiotensin system inhibitor, like an ACE or an ARB, it mitigates the side effects of the calcium channel blockers, the 1,4-dihydropyridines, the, the PINs, and lodipine. It decreases and eliminates the activation of the sympathetic nervous system that occurs with m -lodipine, so you don't get the heart rate augmentation. And it also mitigates the pedal edema because it venodilates the venous uh, side of the capillary bed, which then balances out the arterial vasodilation of the peen on pedal edema. So it actually improves pedal edema and or obviates the development of pedal edema. Who wouldn't want this? If you use a renin-angiotensin system inhibitor, it also mitigates and blunts the side effect profile of a diuretic, a thiazide-like diuretic, if you're going to choose that combination. For instance, it'll, it mitigates the hypokalemia. We've known that. Hyperglycemia, 
possibly the hyperuricemia, hypercholesterolemia, and the sympathetic nervous system activation that it would occur with volume depletion and or diuretic therapy. And vice versa, the thiazide helps the renin angiotensin system mitigation of side effects by the hyperkalemia of using a RAS inhibitor, so it goes both ways. And we've known for, for the, uh, numerous uh, uh, guidelines before today's, uh, and the more recent guidelines, that we should choose one of three separate initial classes of, of antihypertensive medications, the diuretics, RAS inhibitors, or, or a calcium channel blocker, and you can use them in combination, and we can choose any of these three combinations. We're going to talk more specifically about as the advantages of one of these two combinations over others. And beta blockers are reserved only for other side effects or other, sorry, concomitant diseases, migraine, obviously cardiac failure, cardi coronary heart disease, et cetera. So really, we're going to be choosing from three. It doesn't get easier than this. That's why I went into hypertension, by the way. If it was complicated, nah, <laughs> that, that, I'm passing on that. So we could choose. If we're going to start with two medications or con consider two medications, we could choose any one of these two. So we could choose a diuretic and a RAS inhibitor. We could choose a diuretic and a calcium channel blocker. Or we could choose a RAS inhibitor or a calcium channel blocker. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Well, the WHO and the CDC has just charged me about three months ago with coming up, with coming up and leading a white paper on fixed dose combination therapy, either in, in fixed doses or single pill, for the global initiative. It's time. The time has come for us to think globally, and perhaps we should start with two antihypertensive medications uh, in our algorithms at once. But the question became, what's the literature? What's the evidence? And if so, which ones should we choose? And they asked me to develop a white paper and prioritize. Uh, amongst these combinations. I'm going to share you, with you this data that has not been published, but it's coming. What we preferred uh, was a RAS inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker. That's the preferred combination. Why? The accomplished trial showed that it's superior to RAS diuretic therapy. If, it's, if you can't, and, and, and the R, we chose, we chose the the ARB CCB versus the ACCB, best of all worlds, because of tolerability and side effect profile. There's virtually no cough or angioedema with ARBs compared to ACEs, so why put 20% of the individuals through developing a side effect that you're going to change it anyway if you, if you can help it? But now it's preferred. It doesn't mean you can't use the others. This was just the hierarchy that we came up with. I, I strongly urge you to consider this. So if we had our preferred number one combination, it would be an ARB-CCB. For whatever reason, cost was, a, was an issue. Then an ACE inhibitor, CCB, is the second preferred combination and obviously uh, acceptable. An ARB-thiazide-like diuretic would be third, and an ACE-thiazide-like diuretic would be fourth. Why, again? Only because the ARB is better tolerated than the ACE. If cost was an issue, the ACE diuretic or the ACE CCB, perfectly fine. Any of these combinations. The one that we're likely not to recommend, only because of lack of evidence, is the, and also possibly mitigation of side effects, which we'll talk more about on Thursday, was CCB diuretic. And, and we put, we're going to put that in the non-preferred category for now. But if that's all you had to lower the blood pressure and you wanted to start this combination, go for it. Because there's evidence to show that it's efficacious. We just didn't have as much evidence as with the RAS inhibitor, CCB, RAS inhibitor, thiazide-like diuretic. On Thursday, we're going to talk about specific drugs. That's going to get even more outrageous. Does this work? Has anybody been doing it as initial therapy now? In other words, we all go back on, over the weekend. We had a great time. Unfortunately, we have to go back to the clinic on Monday morning. And you see a brand new hypertensive on Monday morning. Should you consider using two drugs initially, regardless of the blood pressure? I'm not saying to do it. I'm just saying that's where we're going. Kaiser Permanente, and I'm going to show you some more data on Thursday from Kaiser Permanente, developed this algorithm over 10 years ago. It's tried and true. 
And we have modeled the World Health Organization Global Hypertension Initiative after this algorithm. Not so much the drugs, but the concept of the algorithm. But this is the drugs that they use. First of all, the goal of blood pressure is less than 140 over 90 in Kaiser Permanente. But look at the, the only one box I want you to pay attention to is the one right, where, where in the world am I? Right there. Kaiser Permanente starts initially with fixed dose combination therapy. They start with lisinopril, an, an ACE, that's your RAS inhibitor, and a thiazide-like diuretic, and the dose they use is 20-25. And they split it, and they tell the patient to take half a dose. So you start with one half dose. They come back one month later, not three months, four months, six months, not when the patient wants to, not when it's convenient. They come back one month later, and the computer tracks this, and you get one of these. You know? I don't know who gets it, the provider or the patient, but we both should. If the blood pressure is still over 140 over 90, they give a whole pill. They give 20, 25 once a day. They come back one month later, and if the blood pressure is still over 140 over 90, they give two of the pills, but they split it BID. I don't know if you have to do that. That's just what they do. Their pharmacy is delirious over, they're deliriously happy over this because they only stock one pill, 20-25 of lisinopril, period. Now they have others for other things, you know, et cetera. Obviously, this is a female conference patient. If you're going to be pregnant, desiring to be pregnant, sexually active, you would not want to use the RAS inhibitor. But this is the concept, and this is initial therapy. When you use a RAS inhibitor and a thiazide-like diuretic or a CCB, complementary classes from that triangle that I, that I showed you, you eliminate the demographic variability. Look at the blood pressure control rates. Before this protocol was initiated at Kaiser Permanente, their control rates were 40-ish percent, 35 to 40 percent. Within the last five to eight years, they've been, their data now has plateaued. They have 86 percent control rate, or mid-80 control rates now within the system. And this, we're talking about millions of patients. And look, it doesn't matter whether you're non-Hispanic, white, others, Asian, Black, African American, Hispanic, it's all the same. It doesn't matter once you use the two complementary classes together. Amazing. Look at the control rates. By following the algorithm and by using at least rigorous fixed dose combination, in this case, uh, antihypertensive medications. Well, I never thought I'd see the day, but two weeks ago, the European Society of Cardiology and the European Society of Hypertension was reviewing our guidelines that we're going to discuss, I think, on Wednesday. They chose not to adopt our guidelines for various reasons, which we'll discuss. But what they did say was, let's focus on the control rates now with the levels that we, with the goals we have now, which is 140 over 90 or less. We're doing abysmally with that. Why lower it further until we've achieved that goal? And more importantly, they recommended for the very first time, and this will be out in August in print, but I have, the, I have the guidelines. They recommended, where possible, to initiate fixed dose pharmacologic therapy for hypertension. I almost fell off my kitchen table when I saw this on, on the internet. And let's leave you for the future. This is now completely crazy and chaos, but I want to show you this, this study. This study was published in Lancet recently. They took it one step further. Rather than two antihypertensive medications at lower doses and titrating it rapidly, they started with four. They started with uh, an ARB for tolerability, amlodipine, look at the tiny dose of amlodipine, 1.25 milligrams, hydrochlorothiazide, 6.25 milligrams, and they added a beta blocker 12.5 milligrams, and they initiated therapy with four antihypertensive medications and crossed them over and washed, and washed out the patients versus usual care. Well, what happened? Compared to the placebo-corrected office blood pressures, the four mini doses of antihypertensive combination therapy lowered the systolic blood pressure by 22 over 13 millimeters of mercury. That's amazing. 
It was also the same with the ambulatory blood pressure, whether it's systolic. 100% were controlled on this regimen versus only 33% on placebo. By the way, it wasn't placebo, it was the regular therapy that they were getting. That's the clinical inertia. Now, the limitations is there was no other active treatment groups, et cetera, and this was a very small study. It was a proof of concept study, but this has gotten the attention of the World Health Organization. And what they're asking now is for globally, should we be doing something like this? Let's skip the two and go to three and four. I said, wait a minute, time out. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still getting there with this epiphany. I'm only half epiphanized. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is, I think, where we're going. This, this was a single pill, by the way, one pill for adherence, et cetera, of cost. Okay. So right now, I think the time has come to consider Combination therapy, if, if you can, fixed dose combination therapy, but sometimes you can't because it doesn't come in that dose you want to use. We still have recommendations in our guidelines that, that allow the usage, but at higher blood pressure levels, away from goals. However, I can tell you, and I'll share some data from the, the, our Latin American Caribbean experience. I shared you the Kaiser data. I will share you now the data on, on Thursday in Chile, Cuba, and uh, Barbados, and also uh, Colombia. Very, very poor, low-income neighbor, though, I mean, obviously very uh, significantly low-income countries with significant increase in control rates, as you can see with fixed-dose combinations, and now our guidelines are even supporting it. Thank you very, very much for happy, having me this morning, and I really look forward to the rest of the week. Okay, well, we're going to take a look at the uh, young woman with low bone mineral density here, and that's going to be our primary thrust. We'll have a couple of other cases if we have time that are short. And <clears throat> you already know the objectives here. So this is a young woman who came to my office after she had been at a health fair. She, her, she and her mother came to my office, and, and her mother said, oh, this is terrible. Look at that. Look at that. She has osteopenia. She went to this health fair, and they scanned her wrist, and the T-score was minus two. And so I said to her, well, are any problems? No, she's in excellent health. She has no history of fractures. You want to ask about uh, risk factors for bone disease. Does she have any of those? Family history, very important. This is the time you're going to take a look and you're going to say, anybody in your family have early osteoporosis? Anybody in your family fracture a hip? Because family history gives you a thought about congenital problems. You can have a congenital difficulty absorbing vitamin D. Uh, you can have a calcium leak. You can have hyperparathyroidism. So family history, very important in someone like this who is coming with a questionable problem with their bones. And what does this scan that she got have to do with anything at her age? What does it tell you in terms of her fracture risk? Well, basically, nothing. But it gives you an opening. You know, teenagers don't, as we've heard much, many times this morning, open up to you. But it gives you an opening to say, gee, you know, there might be a problem with your bones. We're going to look more carefully. But do you drink alcohol? Do you smoke cigarettes? Do you uh, avoid dairy products? Are you on the keto diet and you can't have dairy products? So again, it's, it's a time to kind of take a look at the general risk factors in this type of patient and see if there's something you can uh, change. Because when we have someone tell us there might be something wrong, that's a great time to be motivated to change. So you might want to just talk to her about those things. And we're going to check the calcium and vitamin D if we check anything. You don't have to get labs in these people. You have to just look at them a little more carefully because remember that the T-score only correlates with fracture risk in patients age 50, 60, 70, and 80. If we look at her age group, oh, look, she's less than 20. She could have a T-score of minus 4 at the wrist, and she has practically no fracture risk enhancement because of that T-score. Why is that? Well, a lot of things. She has better balance. You know, I was watching the, the uh, chart about uh, concussions, and it says stand on one foot and close your eyes. And so I'm thinking most of my patients couldn't do that even without a concussion. So, you know, so teenagers have a lot better balance than most of us. They have better bone quality because they're building bone and their turnover is good and they really can enhance their bone mass when they're teenagers. So they have good trabeculi and they haven't lost any trabecular 
function yet. They also have better muscle mass. They really bounce better. You've seen them fall down a lot. And they don't have sarcopenia. So when they fall down, they don't break things as often. So for a lot of reasons, the T-score doesn't tell you anything about her fracture risk. So let's take a look at what does make a difference with her bone mass. And we're going to see this chart again as we go along through the ages. But I have to tell you that your job in the teenager is to maximize her peak bone mass because it's her peak bone mass at age 19 or 20 that determines her hip fracture risk at age 70 or 80. And we know that men, for example, have a higher peak bone mass than women. They fracture later. They fracture less often. Uh, some ethnic groups have a higher peak bone mass. Again, they fracture later. They fracture less often. So your job is to get that bone mass as high as you can while she's in your clutches, OK? And how do you do that? It's calcium, exercise, and nutrition. Adequate amounts of protein. Does this lady eat adequately? Is she anorexic? Just take a look at her. Is she thin for age? Very important. Exercise. In youth, exercise actually helps you build bone mass. Unfortunately, on the way down the bone mass hill, we'll talk about that as well, but not so effective. And calcium, very important. What do you build bones from? You build them from calcium. So it's your job to see that those things are functional. By age 14, a woman has 95% of her mother's peak bone mass. So adolescence is an incredibly important time for building bone. It's also your job to make sure she doesn't have any of factors that affect bone loss. It's your job to make sure that she has adequate calcium intake and adequate vitamin D because the bottom of the slide you'll see that if you don't have those, parathyroid hormone goes up, bone turnover is more rapid, and people actually can lose bone in their teenage years if they don't have enough calcium and vitamin D. And finally, it's your job to look at things. We talked about alcohol. We talked about smoking, steroids, and I'm afraid Depo-Provera as well. Those things retard bone gain. And you say, well, if I stop them, what happens? Ah, you're lucky. If you're a teenager and you stop them, you gain your bone back. But as you get into your late teens and your early 20s, you don't gain bone back as well when you stop these things. So you have an opportunity to help teenagers get the best peak bone mass possible by doing those simple things. Calcium, vitamin D, nutrition. Does she have regular menstrual periods? Is she low on estrogen? Important to have estrogen on the way up the bone mass hill from about 15 to 25. Very important to get estrogen on board. So, Again, be sure you take a look at those things, because once we reach our peak bone mass, it's a greasy slide down the bone mass hill for the rest of our lives. Okay, let's take a look at those factors. What about calcium? Well, if you're a teenager, it's 1,000 milligrams a day. If you're pregnant, 1,300. Again, we'll talk about the other folks later in the meeting. But the U.S. Preventive Health Task Force says, look, you know, um, Postmenopausal women even shouldn't take supplements if they're healthy. And certainly premenopausal women shouldn't be downing calcium pills if we can avoid it. So we have sheets in our office, we have handouts, there are apps. You can find out what contains calcium, spinach, for example. But again, there are multiple sources of calcium that don't involve calcium pills. So I try very hard in my teenage population to get them to eat a reasonable food plan. So uh, get some calcium in there, but it doesn't have to be a calcium pill. Dietary calcium is always best. There is no study showing that dietary calcium gives you more clogs in your coronary arteries or damages you in any way. And the other thing I talk to my patients who are athletes about is that stress fractures are much more common in young women athletes who do not take adequate calcium. The Navy has shown that in multiple studies in recruits. So they need calcium, particularly if they're going to be in, in significant exercising sports. How about vitamin D metabolism? Let me just put that all up. Turns out that vitamin D has become a problem in the United States because we have, we're spraying all our children. We know that uh, the sun is bad for you, and vitamin D, and 
deficiency in osteomalacia now being seen in the pediatric and teenage age groups again because everybody's going out and spraying themselves before they go in the sun. This is good. But we have to remember that the sun does make a contribution to the metabolites that give you vitamin D. So if you're going to put on sunscreen, or ladies, we all put on makeup, that all says SPF 15 on it, that gets rid of the UV light that changes the metabolites and gives you vitamin D. So have to be very careful of that. You may have some of your patients who are adolescents using a vitamin D supplement, particularly if they're in the sun a lot and they use a lot of sunscreen. Remember that vitamin D is important. It increases the calcium absorption in the gut, and it also increases bone production of uh, actual bone, trabecular bone, and mineralization. So mineralization of bone and calcium absorption, very important to get vitamin D on board. How much vitamin D? Oh dear, well, there's a controversy about that. Endocrinologists argue about the silliest things. And so the question is, oh, should your vitamin D level be 30? Could it be 20? Is there a real problem? Well, we know that in some patients whose vitamin D level is between 20 and 30, we can have a problem with insufficiency and poor mineralization and elevated parathyroid hormone, which causes, as we said, bone loss. So most folks think that you should keep your patient's vitamin D levels in about the 30 to 60 nanogram per milliliter spot. That's the ideal spot, according to the Institute of Medicine. So if your patient has uh, any bone disease, any osteomalacia, or if they're at risk for osteomalacia, then you probably ought to get that vitamin D level up above 30. Otherwise, 20 to 30 in a normal, healthy person isn't a bad thought. If you're treating them with any bisphosphonate, it ought to be above 30. Okay. So one of the problems with vitamin D deficiency, particularly in teenagers, again, bone pain and poor balance are seen even in the adolescent patient with significant vitamin D deficiency, but mainly of increased fractures and particularly, in, again, increased stress fractures. So very important to take a look at that. Replacing vitamin D. Well, 1,000 to 2,000 IUs of D3 a day will get you up about, oh, four points on our, on our graph. So if they're in the 20s, you can get them into the 30s with 1,000 IUs of D3 a day. And one of the good things I find for my teenagers is that you can take this all at once. Vitamin D has a long half-life, and instead of taking 1,000 international units a day, if you're not a good pill taker, you can take 7,000 once a week, no problem. If they have significant deficiency, I do replace them with D2, 50,000 international units once a week. You can usually do that for about eight to 10 weeks and people will be back in the normal range. How much D should the average person take in who is not D deficient? Oh, about 6, to 800, I'm sorry, 600 to 800 IUs a day for most people will do it. Uh, but when, you're, when your patients your adolescent patients don't do this, but when your other patients come in and say, I have all these supplements in my giant sack, you want to make sure they toady up. You don't want more than about 4,000 IUs a day. That can give you renal stones. So again, in your teenager, just check the vitamin D. Are you doing this? Are you taking it? And if it, they don't know, mom doesn't know, then you probably ought to check a level because vitamin D deficiency occurs in about 20% of the teenagers in the United States. So we really have to think about that when they come to the office. Okay, so back to the premenopausal with low bone mineral density. When are you gonna get this DEXA? You don't have to get it routinely. As is pointed out before, certainly you don't have to get it when you're putting them on Depo-Provera. It's not, it's not going to be helpful in that system. However, if they have a history of a fragility fracture, you definitely ought to get a DEXA scan or if they're at risk from secondary causes, and what would that be? Particularly low estrogen in the athlete, the athlete that's having amenorrhea, people with chemotherapy, and particularly now patients with anorexia, and also patients with gastric bypass. I have a significant number of adolescent patients in my practice who have had a gastric bypass. Remember the gastric bypass decreases your absorption of both vitamin D and calcium. So, be sure you look in those patients. You want to get a DEXA scan in those folks. And you want to make sure they're taking their protein, 
their calcium and their vitamin D because the gastric bypass is a real problem in that regard. And most of the people who have had a gastric bypass develop mild vitamin D deficiency, if not major problems with vitamin D. And of course, tobacco and excess alcohol definitely ought to make sure that you try and work on those. And lately, unfortunately, I've been seeing a number of teenagers in my practice who are on opioids. And remember, opioids make the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis dysfunctional and can cause amenorrhea in those patients. And if they aren't having regular menses, you need to really take a look at them and see what the problem is, see if you can get them off the opioids. So the history is very important, and particularly the history of steroids or medroxyprogesterone acetate. You have to just watch those people. You don't have to get DEXA scans, but you do have to pay attention to them as they get into their um, 18, 19, 20-year-old time period, then they are not going to replace their bone as well when you stop the steroids or the medroxyprogesterone acetate. They're not going to replace them, their bone as well when you restore their menstrual cycle. Okay, so say you can't decide from the history. You say, well, maybe low bone mass, but none of these historical factors you just told me about are what are happening in my patient. What can I do? What lab can I get? About 90 plus percent of the cases that you see are going to be diagnosed by getting the lab that's up at the top here. So again, 90 plus percent, you need a calcium, to make sure they don't have hyper or hypoparathyroidism. You need a phosphorus to make sure they're having, uh, not having a problem with a phosphorus leak in their urine. Creatinine is always good. Sometimes people have glomerulonephritis and they are asymptomatic. So you want to make sure they don't have significant renal disease. 25-hydroxyvitamin D, remember we measure the 25-hydroxy metabolite to look at our D stores because it is the most long-lived metabolite. You want to get a CBC, a parathyroid hormone is always helpful, again, to look at hyperparathyroidism. And you want to make sure that they don't have hyperthyroidism. So you want to get a TSH. A hyperthyroidism can cause rapid turnover, and particularly even thyroiditis in the teenager, they can lose a significant amount of bone. You want a 24-hour urine for calcium to look for hereditary calcium leaks, and very important, if you can't figure this out, you need a 24-hour urine for cortisol because, unfortunately, subclinical Cushing's is the most common functional adrenal mass, and teenagers don't necessarily get CAT scans of the abdomen often the way adults do, and you may miss subclinical Cushing's if you don't take a good look. Uh, it's a common finding. And when I look at my patient population, uh, I see a lot of people coming in for PCOS, and I'm sure you do too, your, your PCOS patients, particularly the younger PCOS patients. A significant number of them, according to uh, Lynette Nyman, who is an expert on subclinical Cushing's, significant number of those people you see that have PCOS symptoms, they have prediabetes, they have obesity, those people may have subclinical Cushing's. And if you find it, they may need surgery to cure it, and that will cure their obesity, prediabetes, and hypertension. They won't even have to take their combination therapy there. So again, don't forget to look for subclinical Cushing's in your patients who say, oh, I'm gaining weight, little high blood pressure, prediabetes. Okay, well, this is the picture that they brought in to me, and I'm gonna just, and the mother said, Look at this. Look, this is where she's supposed to be up here at the top with the yellow star, and there's where she is in the black star. What's wrong with this picture? What part of her body did they scan? Her wrist, right? What body part is this? Her spine. Well, first thing you ought to do is you ought to make sure you're printing it out on the right uh, body part. But. <laughs> More important here, uh, disregarding this weird health fair, you never use the T-score in a teenager. Under the age of 50, in fact, where we saw that the T-score doesn't correlate, we saw that graph, you are going to use something called the Z-score. And the Z-score compares this person to their age-matched mean. 
And it, the T-score is meaningless because these people are going to gain bone. So what you want to know is where are they in relation to all the other people of their age and height and ethnic background and so on. You want to know their Z-score. And you only diagnose osteoporosis in the young person when the Z-score is two standard deviations below the age-matched mean. Now, the T-score remembers a young adult mean, but this is the age-matched mean, and the T-score and the Z-score don't correlate in people age 18, 19, 20. They just don't. So you're going to use a Z-score, and the people who do the DEXA scan should report that to you. It should be in the other column on the side. It should say T-score, Z-score. You're going to use that, and you also have to have an underlying cause, because again, the people you're looking at are going to gain bone, and you don't have any idea of how that's going to occur. That's just going to occur according to heredity, um, calcium, vitamin D, nutrition. So you cannot call them osteoporosis unless their Z-score is two standard deviations below their age-matched mean, and they have an underlying cause. So did this lady have even osteopenia? Heck no. She had nothing but a very unusual picture of her wrist. <laughs> okay, so therapy for these people, you're going to stop the tobacco and alcohol, you're going to be careful about the medroxyprogesterone, and you can use it. Certainly it's fine, but be careful as you do that as they get into the older age groups, as they get around their 20s, you want to be sure you try and think of other contraceptive groups. Um, steroids and chemotherapy, they probably will get their bone mass back. But it depends. If they use opioids, they may not. So again, you have to look at the other risk factors and treat the underlying disease, particularly the malnutrition, the anorexia. So let's take a look at the steroid patient, because a lot of teenagers have to use steroids for uh, when they have chemotherapy. I see a lot of those folks. Uh, if they have a problem with an inflammatory disease, I see a lot of patients that have rheumatoid arthritis in their teens. And they're on hefty doses of steroids. So if you're going to put someone on more than 7.5 milligrams of prednisone, or its equivalent, and they're age 40 or less, be sure you look at their other risk factors. Are they taking enough calcium? Are they on enough vitamin D? Are they exercising to preserve their muscle mass? And please modify them. And this is the time when you're going to get a DEXA. You have an adolescent on steroids, particularly high-dose steroids. And always, if you're on more than 15 milligrams of prednisone, you're going to get that DEXA scan within the first six months of having them on the steroids. I like to get it at the beginning to see where they are. If their Z-score is less than minus 3, so if they're minus 3.1, uh, 3 minus 3.2, you're going to treat those people with calcium, vitamin D, and a bisphosphonate. If they have a fracture, you're going to treat them with calcium D and a bisphosphonate. And again, this is going to be off-label, and if you don't feel comfortable doing that, then send them. We, we treat a lot of those folks. Uh, but you definitely have to preserve their bone mineral density because they're rapid bone losers and they're going to have fragility fractures. If they've already had a fragility fracture, you're going to get them on a bisphosphonate. You can also use a bone stimulator in these people, and these are the guidelines from the American College of Rheumatology that just came out late last year. Again, premenopausal on steroids, if you're, if you're oh, going to have them two or three months, or they have poison ivy two or three times a year, or they have asthma, very commonly you're using your steroids for asthma for attacks. Most of our patients use the inhaled steroids most of the time. But I have to tell you that even inhaled steroids over the course of years decrease the peak bone mass. So you have to be careful with them. And if you're going to use even low-dose steroids uh, for short periods of time, you probably ought to at least make sure they're on adequate calcium. You may want to crank the calcium up to 1,200, even in your adolescent. You want to make absolutely sure they're taking vitamin D at 600 to 800 international units. That's all you're probably going to need for short periods of time on steroids. But don't, don't neglect to look at the calcium and vitamin D in these folks, even on short courses of steroids, more than 7.5 milligrams of prednisone a day. Okay, 
Now the problem with the adolescent athlete triad, I'm sure that most of you do that, most of you have athletes that you're taking care of, sports medicine folks that you're taking care of. And some of those people are going to develop a problem with their hypothalamic pituitary axis. They're gonna have decreased estrogen and decreased bone mineral density and increased stress fractures. So again, increased stress fractures, really important to get the calcium on board. And remember, it's very important to be a ballet dancer, to be a swimmer, but it's also very important to have adequate peak bone mass. So it's a good time to have a discussion with them about perhaps they could gain a little weight. Perhaps they could cut back a little on their athletic endeavors because they want to have a good looking hip at age 80. So it's time to have that discussion. Therapy again, over and over again, vitamin D and calcium and you want to maintain their D levels between 32 and 50. You want to have a fair amount of D on board with these people because, again, levels of 25D of less than 30 in the young athlete are associated with more stress fractures. Calcium intake, you want to inch it up a little from your 1,000 to 12 or 1,300. Again, fewer stress fractures. And weight-bearing exercise does increase their bone mineral density, so that's a very good thought. But remember, in your swimmers, that's not weight-bearing exercise. So they probably ought to exercise a little bit out of the pool as well, if you possibly can talk them into it. And this is from the sports medicine experts and also the, the Bone uh, Mineral Society. It's a little controversial, but they're both suggesting you don't use oral contraceptives to pick up the slack because when you taper them off, there's going to be a period of hypothalamic pituitary dysfunction. They can lose bone fairly rapidly during that period. So again, controversial, and I'd be interested to see what my uh, OBGYN colleagues have to say about that, but that's what Bone and Mineral and Sports Medicine have said in their latest uh, guidelines. Okay. Okay, well, we're going to shift gears for the last couple of minutes. Do I have time for these two, Randy? Okay. Okay, in the last couple of minutes, and, and talk about a couple of diseases where you can actually save a life if you recognize this disease. This is a 26-year-old lady who presented with an atraumatic left femoral fracture six months ago, with delayed healing. And the x-ray showed, oh, that she has poor mineralization. You're going to practically see right through this lady's bones on this x-ray. She said, oh, I had a lot of fractures, and I, you know, I, I just had a lot of surgery for those, and I just have bone pain, and I, I don't feel well. But look at this. She's also lost her teeth. She's 26. She was edentulous. She had renal stones. And look at her Z-score, minus 3.8. So she has osteoporosis because she has a, a Z-score of more than two standard deviations below her age-matched mean. And in addition to that, she has a lot of other bone problems. She obviously has a cause here. So what's the cause? Again, you recognize this cause. You saved this lady's life. It isn't just a bone disease. She lost her teeth, for one thing. And teeth, you say teeth and bones, teeth and bones. Nah. -uh. Osteoporosis does not lead to tooth loss generally speaking. She had muscle pain and weakness. She has seizures. She has pulmonary insufficiency. Dead giveaway. Broken bones, pulmonary insufficiency, seizures. This lady could only have one thing. Now, you're going to get your usual values here, but you're going to add an alkaline phosphatase at the bottom. And it was very low. So she has a deficiency of the enzyme alkaline phosphatase. And these people routinely die. There's nothing you do for them. They just fractured and fractured. People tried giving them bisphosphonates. Didn't work. They still kept losing bone. By the way, if you give someone a, a bisphosphonate, like Fosamax or a Lendronate, and they don't gain bone and they keep losing bone, they lose more than 5%, you're not treating osteoporosis. And so this lady didn't have osteoporosis. Hmm. She had an alkaline phosphatase deficiency, and now we have an injectable replacement for that, which really did wonders for this lady. She stopped losing her bones. She stopped having seizures. I mean, she really was doing, she's really doing very well. So just remember that. Back in your mind, somebody comes in, lots of fractures, 
z-score is really low, and they have a problem with pulmonary insufficiency and seizures, alkylphosphatase deficiency, hypophosphatasia. Will you see that often? No. But if you catch it, she lives. Okay, our last case shifts gears a lot. And this is the other problem that I see a lot in teenagers, and it's a problem with a thyroid. Is an 18-year-old lady who was found to have an irregular firm thyroid on a routine sports physical. And it was my nurse practitioner who was doing this. She's really, I don't know what I'd do without her. But she was out volunteering for her church to do some sports physicals on, on children who didn't have insurance. Uh, so here she is, and she came out, she said, you know, something was funny about this thyroid. It, it, just, it just didn't feel right. It was kind of firm and maybe a little irregular. And the lady had a positive family history for thyroid disease. So should you order more testing? Absolutely. Every time you feel an unusual thing in an adolescent thyroid, and you say, well, I don't feel most thyroids. OK, that's all right. You don't feel it. When you feel it and it's firm or it's irregular, you really must do something about that. Order an ultrasound any time you feel an abnormality. People say, well, maybe they won't see anything. So what? An ultrasound is cheap and the radiation exposure is minimal. So any time you think you have a problem with a thyroid, you feel an ultrasound, please. And this ultrasound showed a 1.3 centimeter nodule in this thyroid. What next? Well, she has a normal TSH, so you're going to biopsy that nodule. And when they did, she had a papillary carcinoma. Let's take a look. What's her likelihood of having cancer? She's, you say, well, you know, um, I just found this nodule. So what's the likelihood of some nodule you just happened to find on physical exam being a cancer? About 5 to 7 percent in general. Family history is positive, brings it up to about 10 percent. Okay. In a teenager, almost 20% of the time, those nodules can be significant. They may not be papillary carcinoma, but they could be Herthel cell, they could be a, a pre-malignant state. So you always want to get an ultrasound, and if you find a nodule and the TSH is normal, you want to get a biopsy here too. So again, she had no palpable neck nodes. She had no really firm rock in her neck. She had just an irregularity. So the result again, parathyroid carcinoma. It was multifocal. She had a total thyroidectomy. She was stage one because the limited neck dissection didn't show any positive nodes. And she had radioactive ion and ablation. So now she's had everything to get rid of thyroid cancer. And she was followed up, and now she is six years out and has been cured. But if you felt that irregularity and you didn't get that ultrasound, she would have lung mats. <laughs> so again, uh, not to be frightening, but if you feel something wrong with the thyroid, no matter what you think the condition is, just please get the ultrasound. OK, well, I think that's it. And so we have uh, Dr. DePetty and I have questions. And I promise not to hit him with the microphone. I really do. <laughs> okay, questions? Yes. Going back to the oncological perspective, where she said that you asked, what are your oncology fears? Could I? Could, the we, need the, we need the box, yeah, Randy. Yeah, could we have so the box here? For yeah. the uh, web the cast. Okay. Okay. So, what about the what about the OCPs? Like if. You said there's a rebound when you take them off, but what if you just continued them on it and kept them on it through the reproductive years? Is that okay? For the, uh, if you kept them on it through the reproductive years, that's okay if they're not high risk. Okay. You know, if you have somebody on steroids and you uh, say 15 milligrams of prednisone, you put them on oral contraceptives, they probably will not, other factors, but they probably will not be protected because that's just too much of a whap on the bones. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at what you're protecting. And people on chemotherapy, particularly premenopausal women on uh, aromatase inhibitors, mm -hmm. oh, 
they, you right. know, they just, well, you're, right. you're not going to use LCPs. And they, although right. some people use right. progesterone. But again, so it depends on the risk factors. And a person with normal risk, yeah. you may still not restore their peak bone mass to the potential that it would have had if they had not had estrogen deficiency. So they're, what they're saying is, yeah, as a you know, kind of a last resort, okay, but please try to get the athletic uh, prowess diminished a bit. Right, so, that's what I meant. Just, just with the athletic triad, when they're not on anything else, it's just they're the HPO axis deficiency because they have the low percent body fat and all that kind of stuff. Right. So those people, if you put them on OCPs and continue it long term, just into the reproductive years, into college, because a lot of them stop, it, stop their athletics in college, do their bones recover better? Sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. They're pretty young, so most of the time they probably will. But the point is then you're going to have to monitor those people and say, are you on your calcium, your vitamin D? I mean, you're going to have to watch the other risk factors. And better yet would be to say, all right, you need to cut back on your athletics and restore your normal menstrual cycle. And that's what they're saying. They're saying, you know, if you can't do anything else, OCPs are what you're going to use. But you really have to monitor those people. Weigh in on that. See what you think. Yeah. No, I just, unless the recommendations or the data has really changed in the past year, because I looked at this last year, I know that the reason you don't put them on OCPs is because it doesn't do anything to improve their bone mineral right. density. But I thought if you put them on estradiol, like a hormone replacement, like a menopausal hormone replacement level, then you actually did give them some bone protection. Right. The, the, the low-dose OCs don't even protect some of those people. But right. if you put them on if hormone them, replacement, right. you can do that. Uh, right. That has its own set of side effects, but it's the OCPs that they suggest we don't use, particularly the low dose ones. Right, so you can still give them some estrogen can, back, you, which is yes. protective for other reasons, but you give it at the hormone replacement level. level. Absolutely. And obviously that does not provide birth control. Right. <laughs> and for most people that works, but again, the steroid people, it doesn't work. Even hormone replacement therapy, American College of Rheumatology says, please, don't use that as a substitute for bisphosphonate. 